Good morning, everyone. My name is Henry, and on behalf of Overture, I would like to welcome you all to the Rotunda. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to start by acknowledging Ho-Chunk Nation's ancestral lands. Overture Center for the Arts celebrates the rich traditions, heritage, and culture that thrived long before our arrival. Overture respectfully recognizes this Ho-Chunk land and affirms that we are better when we stand together. Now, if you are new to the Rotunda, go ahead and raise your hand. Any new folks? Welcome, welcome. So I'm so glad that you could join us today. For the rest of you, I need your help to lead our new friends around the Rotunda. Let's start with the bathrooms. Can everyone point to where the bathrooms are? Right back that way. All right. And now let's point to our exits. Let's start with our super secret exit. Can everyone point to our super secret exit? It's right over there. And now let's point to the stairs. Can everyone point to the stairs? Right over there. And then lastly, we have our long, long hallway. Where is our long, long hallway? Right over there. All righty. And when do, where do kids sit in the rotunda? On the purple carpet. And when do you come up on stage? when you are invited, exactly. And what do we know about these blue sharks down here and in the aisles over there? They're infested with, with sharks, there's sharks in the water, we gotta be careful, don't get bit. This is for staying clear of the aisles and staying clear of this center area here. Unless you are invited, please stay out of the aisles and out of this center area here. All right, are we ready for the show? On the count of three, let's say welcome Blue Willow Chinese Dance and clap as hard as we can, okay? One, two, three. Welcome Blue Willow Chinese Dance. Good morning. We are so pleased to be here at the Overture Center and for the Kids in the Rotunda program. My name is Tang Shige, and we'll start out at the very beginning Chinese cultural lesson in Chinese, last names first. So my first name is Shige of the Tang family. My name is Joy. My Chinese name is Chen Wan Hong. Just my husband say Chen is my last name. Wan Hong in Chinese means ten thousand red color red we're going to talk a lot about red in the next little while <laughs> okay and so with that we are here for you today with a program of chinese dance and chinese culture um, there are going to be a couple of different places where we will be looking for assistance um, so henry's note about you know joining us on stage when you're invited um, please Think about whether or not you want to be part of that because you would be welcome. Okay? With that, um, we are just going to take off and start talking about Chinese culture and how Chinese dance relates to it. A few basic facts because you have to start at the very beginning. Um, first of all, China is about the same size in land mass as the United States. It has about as much farmland as the United States, but China has four times as many people as live in the United States. So if you, if you do the math a little bit and you think about four times as many people, same farmland, you can see that for centuries, feeding all the people that live in China has been, has been an issue. It's been something that's built right into Chinese culture. The other important thing, or one important thing to start with, oops, give me a second here. I'm sorry, I'm missing a slide. But um, uh, the other important thing to recognize is that there are 4,000 years worth of recorded Chinese history. Um, and when you spend time in China, you, you would learn this in the fifth or sixth grade. You'd memorize the 12 dynasties and when they, when they happened and how long they lasted. Um, but when you're talking to Chinese people about, oh, yeah, the United States has been a country for 250 years. Aren't we cool? 
Where are you going? Yeah. 4,000 years of recorded history can actually be a little bit snotty about it. One of those dynasties, um, the Qing dynasty, um, started about 1644, um, lasted for 300 years, and what we have for you now is, is a dance that's kind of described in a novel called Dream of the Red, Ch Red Chamber, um, in where, where the author describes a Chinese fan dance. So we have here for you now a Chinese fan dance, the Jasmine Flower Dance. <laughs> Thank you, Jasmine Flower Dance. Um, so with more than a billion people living in China at this point, and China historically have had, having had a high population density, um, feeding people has been a challenge in China for centuries. And so when you spend time in China like we did, um, this is a very, very typical Chinese farm scene. Farming in China is a lot more like what we would think of as gardening. The average farm is smaller than a city block, um, and most of the labor is done by hand. Fully 40% of the people that live in China are still farmers. Um, in the United States, it's about 3%. Uh, and what that means is that there is no land in China that's farmable that goes to waste. Uh, this is just off the main highway, just outside of Shanghai. Over the course of centuries, manual labor has, you know, uh, farmers have built these small terraces um, so that every bit of land that could be farmed is being used. Uh, as we're driving by here, the average, uh, some, of the, some of the terraces are smaller than this stage. Nothing goes to waste when it comes to croppable land. And then this is a scene from a, from a Chinese city. This is in Hangzhou. I'm standing on the city street, and you, <laughs> you, know, you go 50 feet, and you're in farmland. Um, in the foreground, we have vegetables, 
for reasons that we will explain, the Chinese diet is really pretty vegetarian. So this is mostly vegetables. In the middle ground, um, bushes where nuts and berries grow, and then clear up on the mountainside, land that we would never have farmed when I grew up in southern Wisconsin because it was just too hilly. But on the mountainside here in China, uh, lined with shrubs, probably, although we didn't hike up there to check, probably a tea garden. We did visit an honest-to-God tea garden when we were in China. Actually, we visited several of them because we drink a lot of tea. Um, and this is in the Dragonwell region of China. The bushes are, have been cultivated over decades, and they're so carefully shaped because tea is plucked, it is literally the leaves of the bush. Um, and the leaves are plucked off, um, they're processed and they're dried and they're packaged into tea. So that um, uh, uh, the harvest in the spring and in the fall, especially of the tiny little leaves growing at the tip of each twig. And so in the process, you end up with these very nicely sculpted bushes. The other, we, okay, so we talked a little bit about tea. The other half of the story in Chinese diet is, of course, rice. The vast majority of the rice grown in China is what's known as paddy rice. There are several different varieties of rice. The most productive is planted as seedlings in, in a, a small plot. Um, and then when the seedlings are a little bit higher, they're transplanted into a large, perfectly flat field that can then be irrigated. Um, because this pr particular variety of rice, once it sprouts, until it's mature, if the roots dry out, the plant dies. So if the paddy is ever mismanaged, if the irrigation fails, or if storms don't show up at the right time, you have no crop. Um, when you're trying to fill the feed a billion people, this is a problem. So we're going to talk now um, and gonna, going to perform with you and for you a Chinese harvest dance. Um, and we're going to do this twice. Once, Joy will demonstrate it. And then since this is a dance that's, you know, it's choreographed not for professional dancers, but for uh, villagers and ordinary people. We've had a great rice harvest. We're going to have a celebration. Um, and so, so all the villagers will dance and laugh and have fun. And, um, and so we'll do this once, and then we'll ask eight of you to join us on stage, um, and, and we'll do a village harvest dance.
Okay, so now we, we, we need eight villagers. Look out. <laughs> and people in the audience, I want you to stand up. You can stretch your legs. You can do it together you as go, well. Go talk to Henry. <laughs> Come on, we need some villagers. Don't be shy. And people in the sea, you can stand up. If you wish, you can learn dance as well. Because, of course, the story here is that um, the village harvest has been great. There's lots of rice stored to eat all winter. Remember, this is an era when there are no refrigerators or freezers. Um, there's no canned food. If you don't have plenty of rice sitting in the, in the granary, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> Yes? Yeah. He will give you a ribbon. We'll try one so he doesn't stumble on it. Okay. Okay. Now, if you were a real Chinese dancer, the ribbon is wrapped around your hand once, and your thumb tucks it in place. Uh, just one, Joy. There we go. Just so you know, of course, it would be very, very bad to have only four dancers. In China, in China, four is a very, very bad number, but five works. We're in good shape. Well, almost six.
thank you. Okay, you can give your ribbons back to Henry. Here, do you need a hand in getting rid of that? There we go. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Go back and see mom and dad. <laughs> Thank you. I'm guessing that's a pretty typical harvest dance. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, another interesting phenomenon, let's say, of Chinese culture, uh, Chinese dragons. Dragons play an important part in Chinese mythology or in Chinese meteorology weather prediction, depending upon how you look at it. Um, and there are all sorts of dragons. The most popular are the nine brother dragons um, that are portrayed on this, on this um uh, park display wall in Beijing. The nine brother dragons, each of them is slightly different. They have slightly different characteristics. We're not going to talk about all nine. One of the things you need to know is that all dragons have the power to create rain. Okay, so if you're an agricultural country, this is a big deal. Um, a couple of the most important of the nine brother dragons, the Futsan Long is always portrayed playing with a sacred pearl of, of wisdom, of positive energy. Um, the Futsan Long is the spiritual dragon um, that points people in the path of being honorable and wise and thoughtful um, and not impulsive and mean. Uh, so his pearl of yang spiritual energy is very important. And then the Shenlong is, is the king of the weather maker dragons. So Shenlong is always portrayed on waves or with wa rain or with storm clouds. Um, when, when there's been a long drought and the rice paddies are really suffering, it's the Shen Long that you're going to be praying to, asking him to show up and, and help, help the rice paddies develop and, and grow better. Uh, so in particular, if you really need a big storm, the way to make that happen is to attract multiple dragons so they'll start fighting with each other. Dragons are pretty territorial. Um, and so if you can attract a couple of dragons and get them to fight with each other, you'll get a big storm, you'll get lots of rain, um, the rice paddies will be happy and everything works. So there are a couple of different ways in China that this is done. Um, in, the, um, in the middle of the summer, just as the weather is starting to dry up a little bit, comes the Danwu Festival. Um, and very frequently with the Danwu Festival, you will find these dragon boat races. Dragon boats are like canoes, except they're huge. Um, I'm an experienced paddler. I've paddled a dragon boat once or twice. They're monsters, 60, 70, 80 feet long, um, a dozen or 20 paddlers. There are different sizes. And when you get a couple of dragon boats together and you have dragon boat races, well, you know, if, if you were a Shenlong, you could be convinced that there are already two dragons fighting here. And you should show up and just go ahead and get involved. And then you get rain for your, for your rice paddies. So, with that in mind, what we brought for, one of the other dances we brought for you today is a flying rainbow ribbon dance. Um, as you're watching this dance, th th this dance is done with two 35 foot log silk ribbons. Okay, um, my wife is a little person. She can fly 35 foot ribbons. It's really pretty incredible. So, and as you're watching this dance, it's not difficult at all to imagine Tu Shen Long. 
fighting. So if you do this dance and you attract some other dragons to bring rain to your, to your rice paddies, life is good. Okay? So we have for you a flying rainbow ribbon dance. Flying Rainbow Ribbon Dance. So we're going to back up a little bit and talk about Chinese history. Now, many of you would learn this in the fifth or sixth grade if you lived in China. A couple of quick notes. Um, em Emperor Shen Nong was, was mythical. You don't tell anybody, but he didn't really exist. Um, the mythical emperor of China in 2737 BC. Shen Nong was very important. Um, he taught the farmers how to grow rice. He discovered that the leaves of a camellia bush, when they were put in boiling water, made a refreshing beverage. We call that tea. Um, he invented the plow. He did lots of cool things that made Chinese farmers very happy. Uh, the Xie Dynasty, 
2,100 years ago um, was also for centuries thought to be equally mythical, but it turns out that archaeologists exploring in China precisely where the old Shia villages and cities are supposed to be have actually discovered 4,000-year-old cities there. So we're busy reevaluating what we think about the Shia dynasty. Um, I, of course, um, think a lot of the Tang dynasty. Um, my mother-in-law named me after the Tangs, after all, so that's kind of important. Um, the, and the, the Tang dynasty, by the way, it was also very technologically thoughtful and creative. Um, they invented the first eyeglasses. I've always been real fond of the Tongs. Of course, they invented gunpowder, and that maybe didn't work out quite so well, but, you know. Uh, and then, the, but the big picture to take away from this is, okay, a dozen different dynasties, a different di dozen different major changes in government. What does that mean? That means a lot of Chinese culture and history is wrapped up in armies and war. Um, one of the, what, you probably have heard of even of this one, but one of the most important cultural artifacts we have, the Xi'an warriors um, buried near Xi'an, China. Um, the Emperor Qin Shi Huang was the emperor that, the first emperor to largely unite most of the landmass of what we think is now is China. He thought he was a pretty big deal. And, and he was, you know. Um, but the religion in which he believed said that you can take it with you. And so when he was 13 years old, he started the planning of his tomb. Um, and the tomb plan included the creation of the Xi'an warriors. 8,000 life-size statues of Chinese warriors, 130 statues of Chinese horses, um, chariots, um, armorers, entertainers. He was going to take a whole Chinese city to heaven with him when he died so that when he died, he could conquer heaven and rule it just the same way as he had ruled all of the earth that he understood. Um, and so now we have the Xi'an warriors. Uh, and one of the interesting facts that just come out about this with the advance in computer technology and especially facial recognition, uh, Chinese researchers have confirmed that the 8,000 Xi'an warriors are indeed, each one is unique. There are no two that are the same. Fascinating stuff. You may also have heard of the Great Wall of China. One of the interesting things, to me at least, um, about Chinese war and Chinese geography is that the area separating Beijing from the Mongol plains to the north is basically flat as a pancake. There's absolutely nothing at all to keep um, horse warriors um, from invading from the north. So there are many walls that have built, been built across the north of China. The Great Wall, the one we know about, the Ming Wall, is of course about 500, 600 years old. It's actually two walls separated by 20 feet with a highway in between that's paved with brick. Um, the Forbidden City was also developed in the Ming Dynasty. Um, a, a half mile by two-thirds of a mile in size, completely walled off from the rest of the city with 140 buildings where 10,000 people lived and worked. Um, and this is one of three massive courtyards in the Forbidden City. The Forbidden City is built like a fortress with different levels, and this is the middle of three courtyards. In this courtyard, the um, emperor um, could sit high up on his balcony uh, uh, in the Temple of Celestial Harmony and review 5,000 soldiers all at once. So, you know, so if you were a soldier in China, 
you were called to inspection by the emperor right here. Um, and the banner proclaiming him as the ruler of the entire world is hanging above. <laughs> um, and this extends also to Chinese culture. Um, a number of you are old enough. You may be fil familiar with a Disney movie called Mulan. Yeah? Yeah? Have you heard of that? Okay. Well, what you didn't know, the Disney folks know, but they didn't bother telling you, um, is that in the 12th century, in the 1200s, Guoman Chan um, wrote a poem. <laughs> book that is a book that would be 1500 years old that has never been found that tells the story of a young woman who uh, who protects her father from being drafted into the army by joining in his stead um, and she serves in the army she's a valiant warrior um, she eventually goes home to to live a, a, a humble, the humble life of a Chinese wife. Classic story in Chinese, Chinese history. So what we brought for you um, is a Chinese sword dance. And you'll note that the dance costume, it looks kind of like armor. Imagine that. So, um, and comes complete with sword. So, the Chinese sword dance. Thank you. A Chinese sword dance. Okay, so a, a, a little story that mixes together a whole bunch of different elements of Chinese culture, if you will, Chinese philosophy. Um, we're going to tell that story for you now, the story of the Jade Emperor. 
and the Chinese zodiac. So, um, and Henry, where did my where did my toys go? Okay, got it. Okay, so the story goes that long, long ago. The ch farmers all came to Emperor Shen Nung, the Jade Emperor, and they were having a hard time being good farmers because they didn't know when the rains were going to come, when the snow would stop, when they should plant, when they should harvest. Um, and so they asked the Jade Emperor to, to figure out some way that they could keep track of things. And the emperor was a wise man, mostly because he was a very thoughtful man. And so he thought, and he thought, and he thought, and he decided he would create a calendar for the farmers. And then they would know what was going on. And the farmers are going, well, okay, that's all well and good, but everybody knows that just a calendar for one year isn't good enough. The universe operates in 12-year cycles. How are we going to be able to tell the years apart? And the emperor said, oh, well, that's simple. We'll just, we'll just name the years after stuff you're familiar with so that you can, can just memorize them and it will all work. Well, how are we going to name the years? Well, I'll name them after animals. How will we choose the animals? Well, the, the possibilities of offending people are endless. Um, and so instead, we'll have a race. Oops, I just got that. Um, and so the emperor announced far and wide there was going to be a big race, and all the animals were invited. Um, and the first 12 animals to win the race would be the 12 animals in the Chinese zodiac. And as it turns out, the tiger showed up, the ox showed up, the dragon. Okay, we know about dragons. The dragon showed up. Uh, the snake. The sneaky, sneaky snake showed up. Um, the rabbit. The dog. Mm, you know, you can't have a race without a dog. Um, the horse showed up. The pig. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. We needed the sound effects. That's great. Okay, the rat showed up, um, and with him, with the rat, showed up his best buddy, the cat. The cat and the rat always, always went everywhere together. They were the best of friends. Then we have the sheep that showed up. We have the rooster happens to be my favorite animal. I was born in the year of the rooster. Um, and we have the monkey. Okay, so the 13 animals showed up, and the Jade Emperor lined them all up and said, okay, so the race is going to be over the mountain and across the rice paddies um, and down, the, down from the mountain and across the river. And we'll name the 12 years of the Chinese zodiac in the order that animals come across the finish line. Okay, so, so here's the backstory. Um, as it turns out, now the, there's a little bit of background going on here. Um, the rat, who is kind of a sneaky sort of fellow, knew he didn't have much chance with this. So the rat caught up with the ox, who's very strong and very fast, but not always the most thoughtful, maybe kind of naive. Um, and the rat convinced the ox to carry him during the race. Now, of course, the cat came along for the ride because the cat and the, and, the, and the ox were never separated. Okay? So, and unbeknownst to anybody... The sneaky, sneaky snake, knowing that he was equally disadvantaged, while nobody was paying attention, walked up and wrapped himself around one of the horse's hooves. Um, and he was just going to freeload for the entire race. So, so the Jade Emperor 
on your mark, get set, go. All the animals take off. They go over the mountain. They go through the rice paddies. They come back down to the mountain um, and get to the river. So at the river, first up at the river was the ox with his good buddies, the cat and the rat, riding with him. They are swimming across the river, and the rat just can't quite resist one last trick. So as they're sitting on the ox's back, the cat points down in the water um, and shows the cat that there's a fish swimming in the water. And when the cat leans over to look, the rat pushes him overboard. And the poor cat is out of the race. And then when they get to the finish line, to add insult to injury, um, they're just coming up out of the river. The rat runs down the ox's back, jumps off his nose, and the very first animal across the finish line is the rat. Shu, the year of rat. So we have the year of the rat, and then we have the year of the ox. New. So. New. So next up, who's next up? Who do you think came in next? Well, as it turns out, it was the tiger because there were a couple of other things going on during the race, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. But third up was the tiger. You didn't know tigers could swim, did you? Tigers are powerful swimmers. And the third year of the Chinese zodiac is the year of the tiger. Who? Who? So the rabbit, no problem running up the mountain, running through the fields, coming down. The river was kind of a problem for the rabbit, not surprisingly. Um, and so the rabbit jumped from, you know, from rock to rock to rock to rock, and then ran out of rocks. Fortunately, there was a log floating by. He jumped on the log. The log was headed downstream, and that was a kind of a problem. Uh, but a favorable wind showed up and blew the rabbit to shore. And the fourth year of the Chinese zodiac is the year of the rabbit. Two. Finally, Two. the most powerful animal in China can fly, can control the weather, all this sort of thing. The dragon finally shows up. And the Jade Emperor is going, hmm, this makes no sense at all. You're the most powerful of all the animals. Why are you number five? Well, you know, as I was flying across the fields, I saw some dry fields, and there were some farmers that needed some rain, so I stopped to make them a rainstorm. And then just as I was getting here, there's a poor little bunny on a, on a log in the river, and he was floating downstream, and I... So I blew on the log and blew him back to shore. And so that's how the rabbit made it across the finish line faster than the dragon. The fifth year of the zodiac is the year of the, the rabbit. Dragon mean long? Uh, dragon. Long. 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 So, not surprisingly, close behind the horse, nobody knows that the the snake is freeloading and riding along. And again, just like the rat, when they get to the finish line, well, it was a, you know, swimming the river was a little tough for the snake. Had to get his head up out of water every once in a while to catch a breath. Um, but when they got to the finish line, the snake unwraps himself from the horse's leg, slithers out in front, and scares the horse so badly that he falls back in the river. And the sixth year of the Chinese zodiac is the year of the snake. Sure. sure. By the way, a, a, a snake means little dragon. And the seventh year is the year of the horse. Ma. Now, Ma. the sheep, the sheep and the monkey and the rooster um, all got to the river. And this is very complicated, especially when you're a rooster and you know, and flying kind of sort of works for a little bit, but not for a lot. So they teamed up. Um, and the monkey found some logs, and the rooster pulled up some vines, and they made themselves a raft. And the, the sheep sang songs to keep everybody working hard and everybody cheerful. 
while they were building their raft. And so we end up with all three animals coming across the line at the same time. The Jade Emperor does the Chinese equivalent of eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and we end up with the year of the sheep. Yang. Yang. And then we end up with the year of the, the monkey. Ho. Ho. And then the year of the rooster. Ji. Ji. Being a rooster, this is, you know, this is a little offensive. He should be further ahead, but, you know, what can you do? Okay, and uh, strangely enough, the dog and the pig are still out there someplace, and finally they come wandering across the finish line. Uh, and, of course, the story is, is in, in Chinese culture, dogs are really easily distracted, and they're always hungry, and they're not always real thoughtful. So as the dog was running across the field, he saw something tasty to eat. He stopped for some lunch. He stopped to take a nap, um, finally made it down and across the river. And the 11th year of the Chinese zodiac is the year of the dog. The only Go. animal in Go. China. Thank you. The only animal in China that's lazier than the dog is the pig. Um, and, of course, the same story, but even more so, the pig saw something nice to eat. Uh, we had to stop and take a break. They were just planting a rice paddy, and the rice paddy was full of all sorts of wonderful mud to take a bath in. Um, so the pig, you know, had to make multiple stops on his way through the race. The 12th year of the Chinese zodiac is the year of the pig. Chu. Chu. And... And our poor little cat never made it across the finish line in time to be part of the race. And there aren't 13 years in the Chinese zodiac anyway, so he never would have made it. Um, but there is no year of the cat in the Chinese zodiac. And since then, cat always chasing the rat. So, yes, yeah, so that was the beginning of a centuries-long war between cats and rats. They were no longer the best of friends and at all. And quick question for the audience. What is this year of Chinese? <laughs> Tiger, got it. Xie xie. Thank you. So, okay, the last... The last story we have for you, or the last part to talk about, um, that is, is an excellent way of understanding Chinese culture and Chinese families, um, is to look at the Chinese New Year. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Chinese New Year, and then we're going to do a Chinese celebration dance. The very end of the song accompanying the dance, um, by the way, includes some really loud noises. They're supposed to sound like fireworks because fireworks scare away all the evil spirits and you want to do that at the beginning of each new year. Um, so when we do that dance, just be aware of that. So preparing for the Chinese New Year. <coughs> the Chinese New Year in China is essentially Thanksgiving and Christmas and the 4th of July all rolled into one. It's a big deal. You have to go home for Chinese New Year. Now, just as in the United States, not everybody celebrates the Chinese New Year exactly the same way. But if you did the whole nine yards, it would look like this. The last two weeks before the Chinese New Year, the entire house gets cleaned from top to bottom. If you're going to paint the house, that's when it gets done. Um, you clean out all the house, and then the brooms have to get tucked away because you wouldn't want to accidentally steer a s sweep some good luck out the door on the Chinese New Year. So you tuck the brooms away. All the food gets prepared in advance. You wouldn't want to be working on the chopping block and accidentally slice a good spirit in half. That's come through a window. So you prepare all the food in advance, and then the knives get put away. One week before the Chinese New Year, um, the, the little poster of Zhao Jun, the kitchen god, which hangs in the kitchen. Of course, you know, before you had gas and electric stoves, the stove was fueled by wood. If it ever went out, it was a real pain in the butt getting it started again. So Zhao Jun keeps an eye on the stove and makes sure that it never goes out. One year before the, two years before the Chinese New Year, 
um, the kids in the household start putting little candies and, and sweetened nuts and treats on Zhao Jun's little shrine there in front of his poster. Because one week before the Chinese New Year, Zhao Jun ceremoniously comes down from the wall, he's burned in the stove, his smoke flies to heaven and tells the Jade Emperor how well the kids have be behaved in the previous 51 weeks of the year. So you spend a week bribing Zhao Jun before he comes off the wall. Um, and then on the new year, all the doors and windows get opened. You get every opportunity for all your bad fortune to get out of the house, for good spirits to come in. Um, you're going to shoot off fireworks to promote that. Um, big reunion dinner. All of the relatives show up. And, and take notes. This is important. When the relatives show up, auntie and uncle show up, and it's... It's the children's responsibility to welcome auntie and uncle and grandpa and grandma and all the relatives to the house by wishing them with prosperity and happy new year. So if the kids have done their job properly, um, uncle has a hung bao, a red envelope, tucked away. Thank you. And... Um, and so the kids who are respectful of their elders and kind and thoughtful get a New Year's gift always, always brand new crisp money. Um, and just like so. Western culture, United States, you kids get Christmas gift. In Chinese culture, they get red envelope. Always eight bills. Eight is the luckiest number in Chinese, so there are always eight bills. These happen to be ten yuan bills that we picked up last time we were in China. Um, and just as in America, um, uh, the kids actually hold on to that thing for about 43 seconds. And then mom shows up, and that's going to go in the savings account and, you know, to, to, to college. And, you know, it's, there are some things that are the same the world over. And then on the first day of the, after the Chinese New Year, new kitchen god goes up on the wall. On day two, no matter how much the husband dislikes his mother-in-law, on day two he cannot forbid his wife from going to visit her mother. It's just the way it is. Um, uh, day five is dumpling dinner. The last day, day 15, most important, is the Lantern Festival, which is kind of a Chinese New Year in miniature. Lanterns are hung all over. They're always red because red is the color of, of power and good fortune in China. Um, and one last big Chinese feast to celebrate the end of the, the Chinese New Year. And so... Um, and then, of course, last but not least, lots and lots of fireworks. Chine uh, Chinese invented fireworks during the Han Dynasty. Um, you shoot off lots of fireworks. Evil spirits hate really loud noises. Good spirits don't mind. So you shoot off lots of fireworks, and it, and it, it scares away all the evil spirits. So what we brought for you, our last dance for today, is celebration. It's a Chinese New Year's dance.
Wait for it. Thank you. So we can have a couple minutes for question, answer? No. No. Okay. Thank you very much for having us. We enjoyed being here. Enjoy your little picture of China. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming today. I hope you enjoyed the show. Today's performance is sponsored by the American Girls Fund for Children, Madison Gas and Electric Foundation, Unity Point Health Meritor, with additional funding by the Keene Family Foundation, Ian's Pizza on State, and our other contributors, including people like you who use our Lego theme donation bin in the back. We'll return next week with Ken Longquist. All right, kids, now find the special adult that brought you here today. Give them a big hug and say thanks for showing me and bringing me to the rotunda. We'll see you next week. Thanks for being here.